Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. Who here has a job in information security? Anyone who doesn't have a job in information security and is looking to get one? Who's got a job in information security and wants a better one? <laughs> all right. We are all in the right place. So I switched presentation software. But it looks like we're okay. Formatting might be a little tiny bit off. Uh, we'll fix it in post. So uh, as my uh, fine volunteer introduction said, and as everybody is aware, there is a lot of information security, cybersecurity work. Um, and also there are lots of jobs, not necessarily the same thing. Uh, a lot of folks are trying to break into the industry, a lot of us are in the industry looking to figure out how to advance. And frankly, uh, there's a lot of misunderstandings. Uh, so um, I'm going to try and uh, clear up a few things. But my overall theme is that if you want to help with our problems, if you want to work with information security, we really want you to come help us. You need a plan. <laughs> You've got a lot of work ahead of you. I want to make sure that you understand what that work looks like, how you can go through it, and what some of the obstacles or, or concerns that you need to worry about, as well as the ones that, that aren't real um, and that people are giving you bad information uh, or perhaps just a misunderstanding uh, are like. Um, and I dribble uh, <laughs> a lot of InfoSec jargon and uh, technical process stuff in here uh, but the talk is intended to be very, very open, very high level, and not specific to any particular InfoSec specialty. Uh, as I hope you all know, we have lots of them. Um, and if you're particularly good at this career stuff, you might end up inventing a new one. Uh, that actually happens all the time. Uh, our field is very dynamic. Uh, smart, motivated people are always making new jobs for themselves, making new areas of research for all of us. Uh, so one of the, the uh, uh, threat intelligence themes, if you will, is the idea of a whitelist, a blacklist, and maybe a gray list. So for the purposes of the talk, the whitelist is a list of things I think you should do. And it is not the list of everything that you have to do. It is not a complete list, but it's the recommendations that I have for you for things that you should definitely look into um, and uh, almost certainly belong in your plan to some degree or another. The gray list is stuff I'm a little shaky about. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Applied carefully, it can help you. Applied unwisely, it can harm your chances of getting the next job and advancing your career. And then there's some blacklist stuff, which I'm going to beg you not to do. And unfortunately, we have to hit a few points like that as we go through the talk, uh, because there are some, there's some bad behavior, there's some poor choices that some folks have made that I want to help you not make. Uh, so that you do get to advance your career and so that I and the folks that I work with get the help that we need. Uh, so it's a collaborative effort. There are absolutely jobs in InfoSec. There are no unskilled or entry-level jobs in InfoSec. If somebody told you that, they're selling something, probably an education program, <laughs> and you need to to check into that, get another source, get a second opinion. All of our jobs require some skills, skills that you can pick up, skills that you may already have. I'm going to talk more about those as we go along. You will, it always benefits you to have knowledge and experience from other work. So the classic path into InfoSec was to go through IT first, right? You work on the help desk, you work as a sysadmin, you work as a developer, and then if you're good at that and you're interested in security and you pass your exams, you get to go and work security full time. Uh, I mostly followed that road, but it takes a long time, it's not for everybody, and it's not the only way to get there. And although there are benefits from taking that road, there are skills and knowledges and, and abilities that you develop that way that are hard to reproduce, it is by no means the best path. There are other ways to get into security. There are other ways to help us with our problems. And we need the diversity, right? People who have a systems background, people who have a network background, are not necessarily the right people to solve all of our problems. 
For one, we are constantly finding and looking for new ways to solve problems. Sometimes knowing how it's been done for 20 years is beneficial to that effort. Sometimes it isn't, right? We need new energy, we need new ideas. But even beyond that, having done something else in your life, having a previous career, having undergraduate collegiate experience in another field is incredibly valuable to us because we secure real things. We work with real people and their businesses and organizations and you need to be able to communicate with them, which we talk about a lot, and understand what it is they actually do to be able to help them. It is not a, we just need to pay enough money and get the smart people and apply the security to the thing and now the problem is solved and we can go do something else. <coughs> Very few of the problems in our field actually work that way um, and that is never a good strategy. Another odd thing about our field that is mostly good and benefits you, especially as a career changer or somebody trying to break in, is that our fields are young and surprisingly well documented. There are not, for the most part, centuries of history and academic research and papers in most of the computer security, information security, and cybersecurity fields. Mostly there's only a few decades, sometimes a lot less than that. There are not, for instance, a few decades of research into World Wide Web application security, because none of those things have existed <laughs> for that long. And although there's some theory going back a little bit farther than that that might be useful to you, the practical research only started when the technology became available. The good news is that that information is available. The bad news is that we don't take good advantage of it. So as someone in the field looking to move up, I beg you to read our history. As someone looking to break into the field who wants to impress us with how your background, your skills, and your studies are what we're looking for, please read our history, understand which problems have been solved, understand which problems cannot be solved, and so maybe you shouldn't spend too much time working on them. Especially from like a computer science or a physics perspective. If a computer scientist tells you a problem is hard, that's not a judgment, that's not <laughs> them being lazy, they're actually giving you the answer to uh, an equation uh, that says that at least that method of solving that problem is impossible. So we need new methods of solving the problem or a new understanding of the problem so that we can develop a new method. So on the one hand, there are no entry level jobs. There are definitely jobs. Another thing that is commonly misunderstood or perhaps misapplied is that for folks who are switching into security, but also for folks who are already in security, you're going to be learning outside of work. In fact, most of us study all the time, even when we're not taking a class or trying to pass an exam. We are constantly studying the systems that we defend, the businesses and organizations that we protect, or new attack techniques that other clever humans have come up with that are themselves innovative and new and we want to try and stay up to date with. And this is the key point. This is the thing that makes our business different from almost any other. We are up against human adversaries with giant powerful brains just like ours and sometimes they have bigger teams and more money to spend than we do. So not only do we need to be good with what we're good at, but we need to constantly be understanding the changes in the environment that we work in, we need to be aware and respectful of our intelligent adversary, and we need to stay flexible and we are always learning. So again, as someone trying to break into the field, this is part of what you need to demonstrate. Both at a low level, or sorry, at a, at a specific level in terms of actually doing your homework, maybe getting some certifications or taking the right classes, but at a higher level, being able to talk in an interview, get to at the end, about how you study, where you get your security news from. We like to ask what's in your home lab, right? These are the kinds of things that show that you get it, that you understand what our business is like, what our challenges are like, and that you really want to help us. So the qualifications that I put up, the barrier, if there is one, that I would say is not college or certifications or technical skills or your background or anything like that. It is genuinely, do you want to help us solve our problems and are you going to put the work in? There's a few others. Communication skills are incredibly important. You need to be able to talk to other humans. <laughs> And we do have some ethical requirements. We are, most of the time, the enforcers of the rules, which means 
you have to be someone who follows rules. And even though it's uncomfortable sometimes, you have to be someone who can enforce those rules against other people while still being a compassionate human being and a professional. And if that sounds easy, then I hope it is for you. It is not for everybody. And my other top level qualification for you is an understanding of what your contribution is going to be. We're not looking for cogs. I'm not looking for somebody who has a set of technical skills. Because frankly, I can teach those to anybody who's receptive. I need someone who is genuinely interested to solve our problems, whose unique background, whether it's their undergraduate major, the job they had before, where they grew up, what culture they were raised in, anything like that, brings new ideas to our hard problems, brings new diversity of every kind, diversity of thought as well as background, and demographics, of course, to our teams and to our problems. And frankly, especially because everybody who's in the running should have most of this stuff, and most of them are going to have college, most of them are going to have technical certifications, this is where you can differentiate yourself. This is where you can start to shine out from the pack of other applicants. And believe me, there are always going to be other applicants. So skills, the core skills for all security jobs are, I would argue, the same. And they are communication, use of computer systems, and data analysis. Now I put communication up here twice because it's that important and there's lots of different ways to think about it. Data analysis, statistics, research methods, heading towards cool stuff like data science and machine learning, but please get the basics down first. Incredibly important to everybody working in security. And this is not a talk about a specific part of security, right? This is not about SOC or forensics or AppSec or compliance or governance or any of the wonderful different things that people do in security. Everybody works with data. Everybody needs to be smart about data. And you really need to have basic skills about how to do some analysis of that data yourself. You need to be able to use effectively the computers and applications that are available to you. And the general idea here is that you should be a power user in whatever systems are common in your environment. So if you're in an organization and you're following this path because you want to move up into a security role, you have access to the applications and systems that that company uses. If it is a Solaris 10 shop running open office, probably unlikely, <laughs> you should be really good with those things before you start talking to people about making opportunities available to you to help them with their security problems for a couple of reasons. One, getting better with using computers will actually improve your quality of life. If you learn keyboard shortcuts, if you learn how to do stuff without picking up the mouse, if you learn a little bit about the automation capabilities that your office software, your operating systems, your, and your data platforms provide, it will just make your life better. You will waste less time waiting for the computer and doing repetitive tasks that nobody wants to do. But it also helps to demonstrate your commitment and it makes you look good in front of the client or the constituent, right? They're coming to you with their hard, possibly scary computer related problems, demonstrating that you are beyond competent with a computer, that you're actually pretty good with one giving them tips, being able to show them how to do stuff they didn't know how to do with their own computer that they might have been using longer than you have really helps to build a good relationship, right? You want them to believe that you're the expert, you're the trusted advisor, you know what you're talking about. And all kinds of communication, communication in different media, email, IM, chat, uh, and, and whatever else we have these days. Is, is telepathy a thing yet? But also in person, and there are as many kinds of in-person conversation as there are kinds of electronic communication. And understanding that communication is bi-directional. If you're just shouting at people in one sense or another, if you're just pushing out information but you're not getting feedback and not paying attention to it, you're not communicating and that's probably not what you need to be doing. Sometimes we broadcast information, but only in very limited circumstances. So those are all technical skills. Really. And you can go to school to learn any of them. But the technical skills that most people are concerned about for a security role are pretty specific to the role. So if you know which specialty you're going into, if you know which job title is your dream and you're trying to build up to, 
If you know you want to be a web application pen tester, if you know you want to be a, a cybersecurity legal expert, that helps you figure out what technical skills you're going to need, and you won't necessarily be able to develop those on your own before you have that job. But you can figure out where the path is, what the prerequisites to those skills are, and how you can get those. Sometimes the answer is college, a lot of times the answer is self-study uh, and your own experimentation. Depending on your target role and your target specialization, these are going to look very different. There is actually awesome data available to help guide you. In particular, uh, there is a data set available from the National Institute for Standards and Technology, NIST, Cybersecurity Workforce Education Project, that is available through web services. You can also just pull it as a spreadsheet, and you can go to a job role name. They have an identifying code for every single one of them, and you can literally see an annotated list of all of the knowledges, skills, and abilities, that's the KSAs, that they believe, that their team of experts who did the data analysis believe, are required for that job role. So from a hiring manager perspective, we might look at this to figure out who we're trying to hire, or what skills we need to train to people we're going to put into that role. As someone trying to break into that role, this is your roadmap. This are, is the list of skills that a whole bunch of experts believe are necessary to that specialty. And experts will, of course, disagree on things. The more experts you ask a question, the more answers you're going to get. But it's really good guidance, and it's free, it's online, you can use it. Uh, I'll have the links in the, the notes uh, when I post them later. Your online presence and the way that you interact with people in the public can have a significant impact on your success in seeking career advancement, whether you're just trying to break into InfoSec or you're moving up, trying to stay in the field, looking to move into a different specialization, thinking about leadership. As someone trying to break into the field, having an active online profile and being in the community helping out is a huge thing. This is something that we give as advice all the time, but very few people follow it. If you can volunteer in person, say to help set up and wrangle speakers at events, thank you, sir. <laughs> That's awesome. Not everybody can do that, right? Understanding your own resources, the time that you have available, your own family and community commitments, figuring out what you can do, that's part of your responsibility. Can you volunteer online? Can you help with the tech support forum for one of the awesome online, uh, open source pieces of software that we all depend on? So a number of the, the security packages that we use have vibrant, busy online communities that are always looking for moderators and people to help answer questions on chat channels in IRC or Slack, on mailing lists and Google groups, and so on. This is a way to not only actually get into the community and start to help us, which is pretty cool, but to show that you're doing it and to start to create this data trail, this evidence, if you'll forgive my use of forensic terminology, <laughs> that you are on our side, that you want to help us solve these tough problems, that you, you want to be involved. If you can help out with those projects in terms of code, that's fantastic. If you can compete, especially in certain disciplines like uh, attack-oriented stuff, there are a lot of online or in-person competitions where you can earn a name for yourself even while you're still studying before you actually try to switch jobs. This is a pretty good option for some folks. You should definitely have some kind of online professional network of people either that you've worked with before who would recommend you again, mentors who are helping you develop your skills and helping you find your way through this path. You don't have to display that publicly, but a lot of people choose to. I try very hard not to recommend particular applications or platforms because I want to be inclusive and I don't really like any of those vendors. But it is a useful thing for a lot of people to have an online professional profile that is linked to a bunch of other professionals, right? It makes it look like you belong. It makes it look like you are doing the work to be a part of the community, that you are participating, that you're talking to people, and that you're open to all of those things. Working towards the gray list and the black list, 
please do not put a lot of information about your current employer's technology stack on your public or even semi-public online information. Does anybody know why this is a bad thing? Is anybody participating in the uh, uh, OSINT CTF event? <laughs> attackers, whether they're attackers who work for us, like pen testers and red team folks, or attackers who actually work for criminals and adversary groups, can take that information and use it to figure out what technology those organizations are using. Especially if you tell them version numbers, it is a gift to the attacker that you do not need to grant. You should be able to talk about your work in a way that recognizes your contribution without talking in detail about the applications that your employer currently has deployed. Especially if you're in a security role, please do not tell me what AV you're running. This is a gift to the attacker that you should not give. And from, from my admittedly biased perspective, causes me to wonder if you understand things like OPSEC and OSINT and what risk our organizations are really at, what a motivated, uh, one might say persistent adversary is likely to do. And along with that, I still see home addresses on people's resumes. Please don't do that. I don't want your home address. I definitely don't want our HR department to have it unless they need to actually send you something through the mail. So, implementation details vary. Sometimes you might need to do that for some reason I don't understand, but especially when it comes to an online profile like that you might keep on an unnamed service, please do not tell me exactly where to find you any more than you should say when you're going on vacation. Anybody familiar with pleaserobme.com? <laughs> and on the blacklist, Please do not post to the internet any evidence of un unethical or illegal behavior. Seriously. This doesn't help anyone. It's not a good idea anyway, and it will be a problem, especially trying to get into a security or information assurance role at a number of large organizations, and certainly any government role, any kind of government anywhere, this is going to be a big problem for you. So I offer advice, generally, but no specifics about what your career path looks like, what your process to hunt for your next job or position should look like. I just urge you to have one, and maybe more than one, right? One plan will never survive contact with the enemy, but planning is essential to mangle a quote. Here are a number of processes from different parts of InfoSec that I think have some application to looking for a new position or exploring a different career field. Up top, we have our incident handling cycle, good old pickerel. I know some folks are smiling and laughing there. Preparation and having a plan and being prepared for when that plan fails and still having a fallback, making sure that you have stuff in your go bag, like your laptop and your power supply. Having a second presentation program, in case the first one randomly manifests a bug you've never seen before. <laughs> Identification, understanding what problems you're facing, putting a plan together to remediate those problems, whether it's, I'm applying to all these jobs, but I don't hear anything back, or the numbers that people, these TA people are quoting me salary numbers that don't make any sense for where I live. What's going wrong? Identifying these problems, researching them, putting a plan together, grabbing your other resources like your mentors, like your support network, and working through them without squinting too hard. You could see how you could apply an instant handling or an instant response process to this. And if you spend enough time in that business, you apply pickerel to everything, even shopping for groceries. Because you never know, you might need more milk. <laughs> you don't want to run out of milk, you definitely don't want to be in traffic or on a train on the way home to have your significant other or housemate tell you that you're out of milk, because, you know, now you're looking at a critical service failure. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, we have an attack life cycle. Uh, this one is MITRE's, but it's pretty similar to the Lockheed Martin one, which is more famous. Here we emphasize reconnaissance, understanding your target. And while I don't really want to characterize your job hunt, 
as a security attack against the people that you want to work for, because that goes back towards that unethical behavior thing that I'm asking you to shy away from. If they pay you to penetration test them, then yes, do all of this. If they have not done that, and you do not have a contract saying that it is legal for you to conduct these activities, then I'm concerned, and you should talk to your lawyer before <laughs> moving forward. But in terms of information gathering, this should absolutely be an essential part of your job hunt. At a strategic level, in terms of, hey, I'm thinking about a career in compliance. Maybe I should read 10 or 100 job postings for compliance jobs and talk to some people who work in that field to see if that's worth looking into more. Or on the more tactical end, I know I want a position in application security at this particular financial company. Well before applying or showing up for an interview, you should be looking into that organization and finding out what you can from public resources about what's going on there making sure that it is what you are looking for, and other silly things like, do they have a business plan? Are they going to be around in a year? Right? These are things that you can probably start to get a handle on from, from OSINT data, right? from public data sources. Um, and this would be part of a good process. You should probably not weaponize, uh, exploit, and deliver malware, again, unless you have actually been paid to do it or otherwise have a get-out-of-jail-free card. Another perspective, maybe vulnerability analysis, scanning job listings, targeting the roles that you're interested in, the orgs that you might be interested in, crafting an effective payload, but here thinking about cover letters and resumes. Some of the same technological problems face you there. Social engineering as a way to bypass HR. Eh, careful there, but it's a good perspective. And a really good resource here is a book by Josh Moore called Job Recon where he actually models the entire job search process around advanced reconnaissance. He also spends some time talking about, having done all this, making the organization that you want to work for create the job you want to have. And that takes a lot of work and a little bit of luck, but if you do your research, you do your homework, and you get lucky, you might just pull that off. And it's pretty great when it happens. Before we talk about your resume, and I've tried very hard to focus everything in the talk about your plan and your data and your success. Going back to helping with some large scale misunderstandings. I'm not gonna try and explain the whole thing here and it's different at different organizations, but let's just say that there is a process and that it is primarily computer driven for how your application, your cover letter, your online profile and your resume are uh, processed. Uh, is masticated a bad word? Uh, <laughs> chewed up? Is that easier? <laughs> processed in, parsed, torn apart, put back together, and queried as part of the first of many stages of filtering that happens before in most of these processes you have any possibility of talking to a hiring manager or a technical contact at the organization you're trying to get into. Now there are sometimes shortcuts around this. I mentioned having a powerful professional network because that's one of the best ones. But just up front here, I wanted to make sure everybody understands that some of the advice that you get from people with different expertise about how to design the presentation of your cover letter or your resume as something that is beautiful, that is visually stunning, that is cool looking and eye catching is not gonna help you at all in this phase. And so the simple answer here is to make sure that you have a plain text resume. And anytime it's going anywhere near a computer system, certainly anytime that you're uploading it to any application system or mailing it to anybody, you provide that version. If you think that you are conversing with a human rather than a chatbot, you might provide both. And you might tell them, hey, here's the computer format version of the resume for you to upload. I also have a pretty printed version if you'd like to look at it. And you can provide both, if that's appropriate. But if you're only providing one and you're not communicating, right, no, no feedback, <laughs> you might want to send the plain text one or the lightly formatted one. Because keyword matching is a huge part of how these filters work. 
they also do other stuff. Regular expressions, whitelists, blacklists, scoring algorithms, and yes, even machine learning and more terrible buzzwords besides are all involved in what is apparently its own industry of processing resumes for companies who are trying to hire people. So another area where some reconnaissance, some mentoring, some talking to your, your, uh, your guidance counselor, if you got one, uh, might help you. For your resume, on the good side, I really want to emphasize that you keep it tightly focused on the things that make you different and that make us interested in you in a pool of people with similar qualifications. Because especially if you get through all those filters, that is probably what you're facing, right? They also match the keywords. They have their CISSP or their GSE or some other harebrained thing. I can make fun of those exams because I passed them. <laughs> As I talked about in the beginning, understanding what makes you special, what makes you awesome, what makes you different, and especially if you've had a job before, <laughs> what you accomplished, right? Not what you did every day, not what technology you worked on, what did you actually accomplish? What impact did you have? Did you make things more efficient? Did you help them serve their customers better? Did you save them money? Businesses always love to hear about that. This is the kind of stuff that I would like you to put in your resume so that I can tell apart folks who are likely to help us from somebody who might have the technical qualifications but who uh, is not my preferred candidate. Please do not include every technology you have ever used, especially if you are not an expert in that technology. There's a, there's a pretty common habit, and it's not a terrible thing uh, on, on itself, which is why we're in gray list category now, of listing a bunch of technologies, like having like a skills grid or a technology list in your resume. You'll admit, I've got one. <laughs> Mine is pretty tightly focused to try and explain what my utility is around those technologies. So I say, I can support your environment if you're running on Mac, Windows, Linux, OS2, Solaris, BSD, whatever. I do not say that I wrote those things. <laughs> or that I can write kernel patches for them. I say that I can code adequately in a couple of languages, because I passed some of those classes in school and I practiced a little bit. But for years and years, I would get calls from recruiters asking me if I wanted to apply for a senior job or developer position. Now I'm not a senior developer, and I'm not really that good with Java, but it was on my resume as a while as a language I was familiar with. Not as something I was coding myself, but actually I was, you know, basically doing tech support and if I really stretch it, application security work with people who were coding in Java. The funniest version of that was in about 1997 when I got a call from somebody who was asking me if I had five years of experience with the Java programming language and were trying to hire for a senior developer. It's a little bit of an age joke, but Java had only been in beta two years before that. The guy who invented it, James Gosling, might have used it five years before that, but it wasn't called Java then, it was called Oak, and yet no. Understanding how the data on your resume is going to be viewed by computers versus by humans, very, very important. And when it does get to a human, to a hiring manager, to somebody who, to use a phrase I'm using a lot lately, knows what the words mean, you want to make sure that you are making the best case for yourself. Please do not include your entire work history or life history unless that somehow is part of your case for why you're awesome and special and why you should be in this role. Most of the time that's not what you need and it's not what we're looking for. This next bit is probably gonna start a fight on Twitter again. So let me put it this way. I've been at this a while. Some folks think I'm pretty good. People at work tell me I'm smart. I teach classes in this stuff, so some of that has to be true. My resume is two pages. If you are not as far along as me in your career, and I am reviewing a four-page resume from you, it had better be full of awesome stuff. Or I'm 
going to start to slide your resume to the which, which way is the I'm not going to talk to you this way? <laughs> some of this is cultural, some of it's country <coughs> or region specific, and some of it's different in industries. So, for instance, if you were applying for a security position at an academic institution, they might actually be looking for a CV even though they're not hiring you as an instructor. Knowing your audience, doing your reconnaissance, doing your OSINT, talking to your network, all, all help you out here. Another thing that I've encountered, and yeah, it was on these four and five page resumes, is a whole bunch of jargon and acronyms from the places that you used to work. If even I don't know what this stuff is, I'm kind of a big nerd, I might have caught on. If I don't know what this stuff is, and I can't easily Google it, it is now either extraneous data, which you've made me scan, which lowers my you know, internal scoring, or it's more stuff for me to ask you about that if you can't explain what it is either, now we have a different problem, which we'll get to in a second. <laughs> On the blacklist, as we started, our theme here is stuff I wish I didn't have to tell you. Do not rely on your resume. Do not include stuff on your resume that you did not do. Do not include qualifications on your resume that you do not have, especially when a simple OSINT search or DuckDuckGo query, or Google, it's fine, as long as we all agree nobody uses Bing. <laughs> if I take something on your resume, or your cover letter, and I Google it, or say I query the board in question that you say that you got this credential from, and they've never heard of you, well now we have a pretty serious problem. And if we do that before you come on site, it's actually pretty simple. You're not coming on site, you're not gonna get the interview. If you are actually on site, and we ask you about stuff on your resume, and it becomes clear that it is not your resume, or that you don't know any of that stuff, we're done. Because this is the easiest way out, and it is not the way up. If you have lied to me, trying to get a job in the ethics business, right? Because we're the rule enforcers. You might be interviewing for a social engineering position. I might be hiring you for a potential position as a professional liar. That might be your technical skill. But if you lie to us, we're done. Please don't do this. And please understand that people do this all the time. But I don't want to bring this up. It keeps happening all the time. Things you didn't do, technology that you're not actually that good with, please don't put that on your resume. If you have to cite a technology in one of your job blurbs for like what you did and you don't have something awesome to say, you can talk about the fact that you have basic familiarity with it or that you used it daily for X years, right? That, that's a true statement. It doesn't suggest that you're an expert and it helps me judge how you might fit into the needs that we have. And we have lots of different kinds of needs, right? Declaring that you're basic with the technology doesn't necessarily disqualify you. I'm actually much more worried about you lying. I can get you better with the technology. Myself and a number of other experts, including a couple in the room here, can teach you that stuff. If you make it through the minimum bar of ethics and you know, showing up for the meeting on time uh, and some other you know, lifestyle requirements. Whew, how are you doing on time? Doing okay. When you are successful at your career plan, towards the end of your uh, path to getting a new position, whether it's in a new organization or you're trying to get promoted or change role where you are now, or even if you're independent and you're just trying to land a new client, because that's pretty much the same process, just harder, you're probably going to get to go on an interview. And it might be on the phone, at least to start, but it'll probably go video or live if we're very interested in you. At least in my experience, the organizations that I've worked with, after a certain amount of screening to make sure that it's worth talking to you, we actually want to talk to you, hopefully uh, in some detail and depth, about your experiences. And we probably believe you have technical skills if you got to that part. You might not. You might turn out to have been lying to us, at which point, shortcut, you're gone. But we think you have at least the minimum qualifications before we bring you in for an interview, or before we get on camera with you for a, a video interview. Please be prepared for that interview 
and understand some of the questions we are likely to ask and be prepared to answer them and maybe have a few questions prepared for the interview team as well that you may or may not get time or have the opportunity to ask, but preparation, right? Planning. This is practically a whole course itself, and I strongly urge you to practice and work with your network, mentors that are available to you, if you've got counselors or guidance people available to you, and we'll talk about the overall community network uh, at the tail end here shortly. But just as a couple of freebies, if you put it in your cover letter or it's on your resume, we're probably going to ask you about it. If it was in your cover letter or on your resume and we ask you about it and you, you can't speak to it, you don't actually understand it, it's obvious you didn't do that, then we're back on the last slide. You're lying to me and we're done. This doesn't need to happen. I'm not looking for you to be the most advanced person in the world with Python or Kali Linux or the Digital Millennium Copyright Act or, or anything, unless that's what the qualifications for that job are, in which case that's a high bar. But that's not mostly what we're looking for. And if you're trying to get into one of these first security job but not actually entry level positions that I think are of interest to a lot of the folks here, having an accurate assessment of your skills and still making yourself sound as good as you can is where you need to be at. And if you're doing that, then I'll be pretty happy. I'll ask you some technical questions to figure out your depth. And I will ask you some questions you don't know the answers to. On purpose, seriously. Why are people surprised by this? Okay. <laughs> for two reasons. One, because it's a fantastic way to check for character and professionalism issues. Seriously. How do you handle a question you don't know the answer to? Do you freak out? Do you like have a health event? <laughs> Obviously, I don't want that to happen to anybody, but if that's likely to happen when you encounter tough problems that you can't answer, this may not be the right field for you, or at least not the right specialty. Because that's all we do all the time. Some of our questions don't even have answers. We just come up with the best approximation we can, install whatever's available from the repo, and go with it. We'll fix it in uh, the next release, right? Yes. <laughs> So be aware of the kinds of questions that we're going to ask and be prepared to talk to your skills, your special background, your qualifications. If we ask you about, say, I don't know, recent significant security news, like some new breach or attack or cool sounding malware that somebody announced, and you go into dummy mode on us, you're not helping your case. And it's fine if you don't know stuff. In fact, please tell me you don't know stuff. If you're trying to get an analyst position, like in a security operations group, which is where I work, I don't know is actually the best answer you can give me. The only thing better than that would be, I don't know, but if I had access to this data, I could tell you within this amount of time. Like, that is a lead analyst. Right there, almost. But start with, I don't know. You ask me a question, I don't know what any of those words mean. Tell me that honestly, but without like getting emotional about it. And we're in a pretty good place. Because I'm not kidding. I will ask you questions you can't answer. I probably won't make up stuff. I mean, I legally could. I don't usually have to. Another giveaway for the folks here in the classroom, as well as all the people that I've interviewed in the last uh, <coughs> years, uh, <laughs> and anybody who ever watches the video. Oh, God, I'm on video. I have been known to put evidence on the table. Literally. I will print stuff, and I'm not the only one who does this, believe me, and I will put it on the table and I will ask you to tell me about it. And if you are trying to get into any kind of analyst position, whether it's a SOC analyst, forensic analyst, application vulnerability analyst, anything where analysis is in your job role, then even if you have never seen that data format before, I would hope that you can tell me some stuff about it. And this is where without resorting to a lot of homework, without like trying to get you to work for free as part of the interview process, because that's gross, right? I'm asking you to do the job skill that you say you have, that we're trying to fill a role for in the interview on a small scale. I'm not the only one who does this, it's not the only way it happens, but please don't be surprised. And now that you know this, you can practice. So if you're hiring, or if you're trying to get a job, in a security operations center or it isn't response group, 
you might imagine that there are some standard data types that we deal with all the time. If you don't already know what those are, well, please ask somebody, including me, after the talk. Easy. And practice with them. If you are studying this stuff, and you are sweating some of the exams that I uh, am making light of, because some of them are in my past, and, you know, one I need to take a practice test on and take pretty soon, so ha, 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 ha. A lot of the same material is there. And, you know, speaking personally, as I said, I teach this stuff. So I have a pretty good understanding of the material and know exactly what to ask to figure out what your level is at. And your level doesn't have to be super advanced. Has anybody heard the story about when Guido Van Rossum interviewed to work for Google? So Google, as part of their weird and vaunted interview process, does a lot of different things. But one of the questions that they ask when it comes to your technical skills is they ask you to rate yourself against the rest of the world on a 10-point scale. I mean, it's qualitative, not quantitative. So, you know, take a swag at it, right? So they're talking to this one candidate for a software engineering position. It's a pretty, pretty uh, well-known guy. And um, at the time, uh, Google was way into the Python programming language. It's still pretty big there. They, they like Golang now a lot, too. So they asked this guy, they asked Guido, in all of the world, all of the developers, how do you rate yourself on a scale of 1 to 10 with your skills at Python? Guido's a pretty cool guy. He's very humble, smart person. He said, well, I will give myself a nine because it is possible that there is someone in the world who knows this stuff better than I do. Does everybody know who Guido is? He invented Python. <laughs> he made it up. <laughs> but in a technical interview, when asked about his skills, there was room for doubt and humility in his heart that he might not be the best person in the world at that thing. So take, take that to heart as well. Don't shoot too low. If you know something, be able to demonstrate it. But don't worry that you don't know something or that you don't have the skills yet, especially if you're just trying to break in. Nobody expects you to. You have a tremendous number of resources available to you to help you in your career path at large and small scales. So in the greater InfoSec community, there are all kinds of cool orgs. There are mailing lists and forums and meetings that you can go to. There's some really great mentoring and, and like job help communities. Some of those, a lot of them, honestly, are invite only. So this is where your professional network can really help you. There are, in those communities, in our professional organizations, and in our hacker clubs, specific programs and competitions and volunteers to help you with this stuff. You can get uh, trial interviews. You can get your resume review. There's actually some fine folks out uh, in the foyer doing that for conference attendees. Take advantage of these resources, both because it will help you, but also because that demonstrates the kind of overall problem solving that we're looking for. In the Atlanta area specifically, we have awesome professional organization chapters for ISA, OWASP, and CSA and probably a couple others that I forgot to mention. We also have some really cool hacker clubs, like our 2600, still meeting at Linux, yeah. DC 404, at Manny's yeah. Tavern for Saturday. Yep, third Saturday of the month. Third Saturday. Third Saturday. And DC 770 out in... Cartersville. Cartersville. Very far away. <laughs> Not, Not from here. here. Not from here. Here is already pretty far away. Where was? So, especially if you are the uh, the canonical new person, if you are trying to break in, you don't know anybody and you don't know anything yet. These orgs, especially, honestly, the hacker clubs rather than the professional orgs, are a really good place to start to find like-minded people, to find people who are either in the same struggle or people who have been through it. So I actually got one of the best jobs of my life and later the opportunity to go full-time in security from a posting to, I think we figured out it was DC 404. And Keith's around here somewhere, it was his fault. That's how I got in at SecureWorks in IT, which I was later able to transition over to a full-time security job. So Hacker Club's pretty great. They also have presentations. 
uh, of different educational value, or sometimes some guy just gets up and starts ranting about career stuff. <laughs> In your personal community, your family, your other social organizations, right, because we're very open here. People have different families, different religions, culture, whatever you got, there are probably people available to you who can help with some of this stuff. Even if they don't know anything about InfoSec, they can probably help you through dialogue understand what's special about you and what you can do to emphasize that, how you can communicate about that, how you can talk yourself up without lying or making stuff up. Different. Uh, yeah, so short answer there, start going to meetings, which, you know, is a little funny for me because I hardly ever make it to one. So we just have a few minutes left. Does anybody in the room have any questions? I want to ask about two things you mentioned about resumes. You said not to use multiple pages. Is two pages okay? So I tried to be a little careful because it's a controversial topic. What I said is mine is two pages. Okay. <laughs> have as many pages as you need to tell the story you need to tell. Um, if you're trying to get a higher level position, you may need to demonstrate that you've done this job successfully in a number of organizations of different sizes, right? That may be the, the story that you need to tell. But especially if you're just getting started, I would, I would shy towards the, the shorter resume and remember that the computer's going to digest it before I get a chance to. And one other, you mentioned um, using a text, text format, an ASCII format to upload it. Um, the guy doing my resume review also said I could use RTF format. Is that acceptable as well for uploading? Uh, it's probably okay. It just causes security bells to ring in my head for a totally unrelated reason. ASCII text is safer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say it's safe because that's not the world we live in, but it's a heck of a lot safer than RTF because RTF has had some surprises. Okay. Well, a lot of the resume sites will specify the format, but what he's, what he's really getting at is People think that Microsoft Word or PDF or even RTF, they use fancy fonts and put underlines and all kinds of crazy stuff yeah. in it. Stick to, you know, aerial block type. You know, or, or at least have a, have, a, have a boring version, yeah. please. What about what HTML, saying? which can be parsed? <laughs> so you guys let let me let me handle this, okay? Uh, sorry. So was there was there another question? Yes, oh, yes please. Um, so you mentioned that um, we shouldn't put like um, our environment, like the OS versions and all of that. But when you're asked about like the specific operating system versions that you worked on, like what do you say at that point? So if you're actually in an interview, you might already be under NDA which helps. If you're just talking to somebody about a job opportunity, you kind of have to make the judgment call. And sometimes it just depends on where you worked. If you worked at a civilian organization with uh, reasonable levels of security, but you, know, you didn't have any kind of clearance or any kind of crazy government stuff, then you just have to decide if you trust the people that you're talking to enough to share that information with them. I just beg you not to make it public on the internet, if that makes sense. If you did work for some of those places, you absolutely are not allowed to talk about the technology that you used, which is another reason to have all this other stuff to talk about, right? To have these other skills, to have these experiences, this stuff that's special about you, if you actually you know, worked in the intelligence community or if you've been enlisted for 15 years and you, you honestly aren't allowed to tell me what you've been doing, then we need something to talk about, otherwise the interview gets really awkward. Those are not much fun either. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Awesome. Uh, Yep, okay. So thanks for the questions. Uh, thanks everybody for your time. Hope you enjoyed it. I'll, I'll get the, the slides and the links posted. Um, and if you're looking for me and haven't found me already, that's me. Thanks very much.